Hey everyone, welcome to Julie Noted, the part of the show where I talk about the news, timely topics of today. Just a reminder, before we dive into this episode, be sure to hit the subscribe button down below and follow me at Julie R. Hartman on Instagram and Twitter. Now, when the news is a bit slow, I like to take a Julie Noted episode and do a deep dive into a timely development of consequence. In future episodes, I'm going to talk about the situation at the border, how many migrants have crossed in, why are they crossing in, what does asylum law say right now, et cetera. I also want to do a show on the different presidential candidates for both the Democrat and Republican Party and talk about what various positions they hold. But today, we're going to do a deep dive into what I argue is the most consequential international development of our time. This is something that has metastasized only in the last few months. It's not Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it's China's encroaching power in the Middle East. This is something that is a huge deal. It is not bannered on headlines in newspapers or on TV, but nevertheless, it's something that we should be discussing and will also be of huge consequence to us in decades going forward. You will hear why in this episode. Now. The real international development, as I've talked about on Julie Noted, is that China is trying to pit many countries against us, not just in the Middle East, but all around the world. And we have seen that China's anti-American rhetoric has stepped up hugely over the past few months, really since President Biden took office, and especially since the 20th Party Congress back in October of 2022, where Xi Jinping made a speech about combating the United States hegemony in the world. Also, in addition to Xi Jinping's remarks about the United States, several top Chinese diplomats have made similarly irksome comments about the United States. For instance, one of the top diplomats, Wang Yi, said that the United States was engaging in, quote, encirclement and containment of China. They didn't provide specifics. It's a bit unclear as to how we, the United States, are specifically do that, doing that. But nevertheless, Chinese diplomats, diplomats have, in, have uh, accused excuse me, Americans of doing that. And crucially, this diplomat, Mr. Yi, said that if the United States does not change course, surely they will be met with, quote, conflict and confrontation. We have not seen China or another country do something like this to the United States in recent years, especially a country like China, which is the second largest economy in the world, one of our principal adversaries, one of our principal trading partners, for them to come out so boldly against the United States really says something. And it, it says something especially about the way that they think of our president and our leaderships that, leadership that they can get away with those threats. Now, Xi Jinping, as I said, has been trying to kind of pit the world against the United States. He has met with various world leaders. Most recently, President Lula of Brazil visited China, and even Lula himself was making anti-American remarks. He said, quote, every night I ask myself, myself well, why all countries have to base their trade on the dollar. So Lula and Xi Jinping were talking about moving the global economy away from being primarily based or working around the United States dollar. They want to transition that to having the world economy work around the Chinese yuan. Now, even one of our allies, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France, has recently said some comments with regard to China that are anti-American. He said in a meeting with Xi Jinping, quote, the worst thing that we could do, we being France, is to think that we Europeans must become followers on this topic. The topic he's referring to in this quote was actually pertaining to China's possible invasion of Taiwan. President Macron continues it, that it would also be bad for Europeans to become followers and quote, adapt to the American rhythm or a Chinese overreaction. I could list many more quotes with Xi Jinping or other top Chinese diplomats and world leaders in which they're talking about combating or challenging the United States in a way. Viktor Orban of Hungary is another leader who's gotten quite close with Xi Jinping. Gustavo Petro, the president of Colombia, is yet another. And what China does, and those of you who watch Julie Noted know I talk about this a lot, 
What China does is that they go into countries and industrialize and economically develop those countries. And it is a clandestine, brilliant way of buying those countries off. So that when something happens, when China maybe oversteps its boundaries, those countries cannot react. For instance, when the second Chinese spy balloon traversed over Latin America, the first one we all remember traversed over our country and our continent, North America, until uh, President Biden had people shoot it down over the coast of South Carolina, a second Chinese spy balloon actually traversed over South America. And when it went over Costa Rica and Colombia, Gustavo Petro, the president of Colombia, said nothing. None of these Latin American leaders said anything that was challenging China for sp sending a spy balloon. Now, why is that? It's because Xi Jinping and Chinese companies have come into these countries. They're building a railway line in the capital of Colombia. They have provided COVID vaccinations to the continent. They're doing a lot of works on ports and building terminals. And when you hand out some goodies, there's always, always strings attached. So that is what is China, China is doing around the world. But the reason why we are focusing on the Middle East today is that the Middle East is really the future. Certainly everywhere in the world is the future, but demographically especially, the Middle East is beating any region in the world by a long shot. On the timeless part of this show, I recently had a demographer named Ken Gronbach on the program, and he told me on this episode that you all can watch, I highly encourage you to, because we focus on so many things. We focus on economics, we focus on political moving arounds, but we don't focus on population growth and population decline. And Mr. Gronbech has said that this will determine and indeed be a good predictor of trends in the world and how things will play out. He said that China actually is going to witness a huge demographic problem in just about a decade and a half. This is because of the one child policy that was instated in China from 1979 and only reversed in 2015. So this means that much of China's 1.4 billion people are old and they're going to die out in the next decade. And there's a shortage of young people. So China is really going to have an issue demographically. Also, he said India is a country that is sort of doing well demographically, but not as well as you might think. The United States and Europe are actually having a, a slower birth rate, but he said the, the area of the world that is just booming is the Middle East. So if China's coming in and asserting a lot of power in the Middle East, from a demographic standpoint, that should matter to us because that is where we're going to see a lot more people being born and thus a lot more power being concentrated. So that's reason number one for focusing on the Middle East. The second, of course, is oil. The Middle East has 50% of the world's oil reserves. We all import oil from that part of the world. Now, it doesn't have to be this way. Actually, under President Trump and under uh, previous administrations, both Democrat and Republican, the United States was actually energy independent. We have rich oil reserves in Texas, off the shores of Florida, even off the shores here of my home state in California. But yet under President Biden, he has pursued this green new energy strategy where he has talked about no more fracking and no more drilling in the United States. And so this has left us with an energy problem. We are not yet at the, at the stage in our society where we can totally transition, for instance, to electric powered vehicles or to solar pa panels. We still need fossil fuels. And so we are having a shortage of drilling here in the United States. And what's happening in return? Well, President Biden, as he did a few months ago, is entreating to the Middle East, specifically to the Saudis. At the end of last year, in 2022, President Biden flew over to Saudi Arabia. He met with the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. They did this really awkward fist bump because President Biden didn't want to shake hands with him, but thought that a fist bump would somehow be better. Anyway, President Biden begged the Crown Prince to send the United States more oil and to increase oil production. This was a really embarrassing moment for the United States. Mohammed bin Salman said yes, and then the second Biden left, he turned around and said, nope, we're not going to do that. We're not going to send oil to the United States. Do you understand what a diminished position that makes us, the United States, look? 
I mean, we are begging dictatorial regimes for a resource that we can competently produce on our own, and they're just, for the fun of it, toying us around. And then after President Biden entreated to the Saudis, he actually went and entreated to another vicious dictatorial regime, that is the Venezuelans, who also rejected our pleas. So we have an oil problem, and China is coming into the Middle East, and they're capitalizing on those oil reserves, and they may, down the line, sooner than we might think, use that against us. That's reason number two for focusing on the Middle East, oil. And number three, this region of the world, in particular, has enormous anti-American animus. In some ways, perhaps that anti-American animus, as much as I hate to say it, is deserved. We engaged in some very not well thought out wars in the early 2000s in Iraq and Afghanistan, which really decimated those countries and didn't appear to achieve our gains. Also, just two years ago, almost exactly two years ago, in August of 2021, President Biden had that horrible withdrawal from Afghanistan, which left $85 billion of American weaponry in the hands of the Taliban, which may seem like a good thing for, for the Middle East, that is, of course, not for us. And of course, there are some who are happy about that, but many Afghans were killed because they were coming out against the Taliban. They were pro-American or at least aligning with the American troops in that region. And then when President Biden initiated that withdrawal, so many Afghans, although we did allow some to come on military planes to seek refuge here in the United States, thousands and thousands of Afghans were left behind to be slaughtered by the Taliban. That's just one example, but in that region of the world, there is this enormous anti-American animus, and it is consequential for us if there is a populous, ever-growing, powerful, resourceful region of the world that hates us and may dislike us even more with Xi Jinping adding fuel to the fire, again, we should all pay attention to it. This is all to say, I really want to emphasize this in this episode, this has happened so fast, this meaning uh, Xi Jinping and China's encroachment in the Middle East. You know when you're driving in your neighborhood and you see a new building or a new house being built and you see the foundation laid for it and you go, oh, they're, they're doing a new building project over there. And then you totally forget about it and you drive by the same place two months later and you turn and you go, what? How, how did that house get built so fast? How did that happen? That is sort of an analogy for what we are seeing now. President Biden and our Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, have really been asleep at the switch here. And I know what you all are thinking. Of course, Julie's blaming President Biden and Secretary Blinken. She doesn't like them. I think I have good reason not to uh, be fond of them. However, we cannot deny the facts that this situation has changed hugely in the past few months and ever since President Biden took office. When President Trump was in office, we were actually dominating in the Middle East, dominating not so much as like taking control, but being a power and a, having a presence in the Middle East. For instance, President Trump signed the historic Abraham Accords, which brought Israel close to some of its historically um, uh, con uh, adversarial, that is the word I'm looking for, adversarial countries such as the UAE, Bahrain, Morocco, and Israel was even thinking that they would get closer to some other neighboring Arab countries. How the tide has turned. Now these neighboring Arab countries are becoming closer together thanks to China, and our position in the Middle East is dwindling. Meanwhile, President Biden's most recent trip before the G7 summit that he went to in Japan, but his most recent solo international relations trip was to Ireland, okay? No shade to the Irish. I'm half Irish myself. Ireland is not that important right now for United States international relations. President Biden and Secretary of State Anthony Blinken should be traveling back and forth once a month at least to the Middle East and to those neighboring regions of the world where all of the action is happening. As great as Ireland is, there's really no need to go there. Also, President Biden visited recently with the president of South Korea. Great, but is South Korea really of consequence to us right now, for better or for worse? No. So let's look at what China has done here in the Middle East. China has principally used its alliance with Iran as a gateway to the rest of the Middle East. Iran is this gateway for China because first, it's the second largest country in the Middle East, 
And also, unsurprisingly, it is very rich in oil reserves. Iran actually has 25% of the oil reserves in the Middle East and 12% of the oil reserves in the world. Just a few months ago, again, it shows you how fast these things have changed. Iran was experiencing its biggest civilian upheaval since the 1979 revolution. This started back in September of 2022, when a 22-year-old, Masa Amini, was in Tehran, the capital of Iran, and she was wearing her hijab a bit loosely. A, little, a few strands of hair were poking through that hijab. And she was arrested, kidnapped by police, tortured, and executed within three days for the sole offense of just wearing her hijab or head covering loosely. This horrible event led to widespread protests across Iran, the biggest since the 1979 revolution. And Iran actually, in a stunning move, disbanded its morality police. Its morality police, it's an Orwellian name, but it's actually really a thing in, in Iran. It was established in order to to enforce the Sharia law dress code. Iran got rid of that, at least for the time being. There were also heavy sanctions that were levied on Iran from the West. So I interviewed Masi Alina Jad, who is a um, Iranian woman. She is very pro civil rights for uh, women in her home country who are being abused by the misogynistic Ayatollahs and Iranian government. Uh, she was my first guest ever on the show and I talked to her and she was saying that Iran was at this pivotal point where it seemed like Iran was running out of options because of all of this upheaval. Now, just about six or seven months later, it has changed so much. Let's look a little bit at a timeline. In early January of this year, the Iranian president, Ibrahim Raisi, visited Beijing. Beijing is at the center of all of this change of Iran being in a, a state where they didn't have a lot of options to now partnering with, with China and growing in the Middle East. China's at the center of all of it. So in January, this Iranian president visited Beijing. This was the first visit by an Iranian leader to China in 20 years. China is Iran's number one oil purchaser. Actually, China purchases 1.2 million barrels a day of Iranian oil alone. And they have been growing this uh, purchasing. This is actually up from 130% from 2021. So these two leaders meet. Clearly, they are of uh, economic benefit to one another. And unsurprisingly, this anti-American rhetoric continues. The president, Ibrahim Raisi of Iran, said, quote, resistance, i.e. to the United States, will turn the threat, i.e. the United States, into an opportunity for both China and Iran. So during that visit, Iran and China extended the terms of a 25-year agreement that they signed back in 2021. China always, throughout its history, I shouldn't say always, throughout its recent history, I should qualify, has thought in terms of a long-term vision. So it makes sense that they are signing this 25-year agreement with Iran. So what did they add on to this? Well, China is going to invest $400 billion into Iran. They've agreed to build a railway line in Tehran, the capital of Iran, to industrialize the Ayatollah Khomeini International Airport, to build up Iran's nuclear energy. And speaking of nuclear energy, by the way, the International Atomic Energy Agency said that Iran has actually enriched uranium to 84% purity. 90% purity is needed in order to make an atomic bomb, which is one of the two types of nuclear bombs. So Iran is, is getting really close to being a nuclear uh, power. And China is now investing $400 billion into this country to help export expedite that process. Also, as part of this agreement, China is going to build and invest in ports in Iran, invest in their military, and crucially, China is going to build up their technology for extracting oil and gas. So by helping turn Iran into this economic powerhouse, this is helping China secure its own access to oil. And what China is doing is that they are shielding themselves from Western sanctions. They want to get it totally economically and especially energy independent from the West. 
And we have seen during the Russia-Ukraine war, one of the biggest things that has happened is that the United States and other Western powers have slapped on sanctions with regard to Russian natural gas. And they thought that this would be a big deterrent for Russia, but actually it hasn't been as catastrophic as the West had hoped. Because A, Western Europe is heavily dependent upon, um, upon Russia, excuse me, for natural gas. And also China, thanks to China's now friends in the Middle East, has helped Russia economically so as to not be so crippled by those Western sanctions. China's doing the same thing with, for themselves right now. They want to secure that economic line to get oil from their number one oil producer in Iran and shield themselves away from the United States, okay? That's what happened in January. In March, just two months later, China brokered an agreement between Iran and Iran's former bitter adversary, Saudi Arabia. Why were these two countries adversaries? Well, the Saudis are Sunni, the Iranians are Shia. This sectarian divide is a big deal in the Muslim world. In addition to that, the Saudis and the Iranians were fighting proxy wars in different parts of the Middle East, such as Yemen, and these were horribly bloody, catastrophic wars. And they just historically didn't like each other. The, the Saudi crown prince said that the Iranian president, quote, made Hitler look good. So China swoops in. The Saudis and the Iranians hate each other. And they view this just under two months ago as an opportunity to bring them together. China initiates its peace deal. Now Iran and Saudi Arabia have agreed to stop the aggression towards one another. They're also exchanging ambassadors. And China, in addition to building up Iran economically, has agreed to build hydrogen energy developments and telephone lines and other things in Saudi Arabia. So you're probably thinking, okay, why does this matter? So China is going into Iran, securing the economic line for itself. But why does it really matter that China is bringing these two uh, enemies closer together? Well, this is a big deal for many reasons. The first is that this thawing of relations between Saudi Arabia and Iran is significant simply because China brokered it. Usually countries, not just in the Middle East, but all around the world, look to the United States as the world power that brokers deals. I mentioned the Abraham Accords that President Trump brokered between Israel and, and surrounding Arab countries. We all, I mean, we have, we have brokered so many deals, the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the constituent Soviet socialist republics, also the downfall of Yugoslavia, the recent civil war that happened in Sudan, the list goes on and on. People have looked to the United States to be that world leader. The fact that China is now coming into that position is a big deal because it's showing that the world is looking towards other powers to broker agreements. They no longer need the United States. So that's one reason. Another reason why this thawing of relations is a big deal and very deft of China is that it secures yet another economic block for China that can and will potentially be used against the United States. Saudi Arabia is another incredibly oil-rich country. China is also the number one producer of Saudi oil in addition to Iranian oil. President Biden, as I said, entreated to the Saudis for oil. They said no, which was so embarrassing. So now, with China's help, the Saudis can just give the finger to the United States. When they have an economic power, like China investing in, as I said, telephone lines, hydrogen development, oil and natural gas extraction, they have no reason to keep good relations with the United States, and they certainly don't have any reason to help us. And so interestingly, in this deal that happened back in March, all three powers, that is China, Iran, and Saudi Arabia, said in the agreement that they want to, quote, cast off external influences. That's the United States. And as we are pursuing these perhaps well-intentioned but terribly thought out Green New Deal policies, we're really going to need the Middle East for oil. So it is not good that these big oil producers are coming together to cast us off. And another reason that this uh, agreement is, is big is that it has unified the Middle East against the United States in ways that are bigger than just economically. Now, as I said, the United States obviously had sort of inspired some anti-American animus in the Middle East. Our wars of the early 2000s and the withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2021 were certainly not helpful to that cause. But still, 
the United States with regard to, to world relations, we want to either A, be a peace broker, or B, if we can't be a peace broker, to have our adversaries be divided. As terrible as it sounds, we benefited from a Saudi Arabia that was in an adversarial position against Iran. Because if we divide the Middle East and we have powers that may not be as willing to cooperate with one another, then those powers cannot so easily come together to unify against us. It's just the way that international relations work. But now we are accomplishing neither of those roles under this new agreement. We're not the peacemaker. China's the one facilitating these two countries coming together. We're not doing that. And we're also not keeping them divided. They're now friends. So we're in a really tough position. And so now that Sunni Saudi Arabia and Shia Iran are friends, what you saw happen just in the past month is that all these other countries that were formerly adversarial have also become friends because of this deal. For instance, Saudi Arabia, a Sunni country, has become closer with Syria, which is a Shia country. S Syria and Iran were usually allied against Saudi Arabia, but since Iran and Saudi Arabia are becoming friends, Iran's friends are becoming friends with Saudi Arabia. And in, in a prime example of that is what I reported just about two weeks ago. Syria was readmitted to the Arab League. The Arab League is a conglomerate of 22 nations. This group was founded after 1945 to combat US hegemony. And just about 10 years ago, they kicked Syria out of the Arab League because of the Syrian civil war. Now, thanks to China, all of these countries in this part of the region, or part of the world, this region of the world, I should say, are coming closer together. Now, of course, this doesn't mean that they're all friends and they all hate us and it's all you know downhill from here. That's not the case. But the point of all of this is to show you how fast things can deteriorate in a short amount of time. Just four years ago, President Trump signs the Abraham Accords. We were the negotiating power in the Middle East. We brought Israel, a pro or a Western aligned country, closer to countries in the Middle East, closer to its adversaries of UAE, Morocco, and Bahrain. Even the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, upon entering the prime ministership just about a year ago, he thought that the next step for Israel would, to bring, would be to bring Saudi Arabia into that group of uh, the nations that allied with Israel during the Abraham Accords. Not anymore. Saudi Arabia is now in the Iran and China camp, and it certainly does not bode well for Western interests. So in 2024, we all need to vote for foreign as well as domestic policy. Thank you all so much for listening today. I hope that this was helpful and gave you some more of an idea of what's going on in this very tumultuous but consequential part of the world. As a reminder, hit the subscribe button down below so that you can see all my deep dives, all my timeless episodes, and I'll see you soon.